it, but I mean, I could talk for hours about this. Like, I, I mean, there's so many different layers to what's happened to us. There's initial trauma, and then there's everything that comes after it. And so there's a lot of things that we could sit here and talk about. Recently, I had a conversation with Eleanor Dillman and her mother, Erin Hedges. They invited me to their Meridian Kessler home here in Indianapolis about eight months after they experienced a very tragic loss. Brian Dillman, their adored dad and beloved husband, went for a walk on a beautiful May day and he never came home. Brian was hit as he was walking along the sidewalk. Court documents revealed that the same woman who hit him has a seizure disorder and she was advised not to drive for six months until she was cleared by a neurologist. But just three weeks later, she was out driving again and police say that she caused another accident, killing a mother of four. Well, as you can imagine, there was a lot of media coverage. Much of it focused on the driver, her driving record. But what about the victims and what about Brian first? What about his loved ones. Here's our conversation. Well, I woke up, woke up, I didn't really sleep that night, but I kind of got up the morning after and I woke up to a text from someone from my middle school that I hadn't spoken to in years. And they were like, sorry, this happened. It's all over the news. And I was like, it is? Like, I didn't, that didn't cross my mind that it would be on the news. Like, I just didn't think about that. And so it was just, I didn't even, no one was like, oh, by the way, brace yourself. Like, this is going to, everyone's going to know. Because before I even really had known what happened, everyone else did too. And so I walked into school. I only missed one day of school because I'm like that. And I wouldn't let myself miss any more than that. But I walked into school like the next day and everybody knew. And suddenly I went from being the cross-country high achiever runner musical kid to being the dead dad girl and that's just that was my new persona that's who I was and so everybody knew and some of them knew more than I did because I I tried not to read as many of the articles as I there were I read a lot of them but some people knew more about the own the case than I did and so it was weird having that many people in my life like being that vulnerable not by choice with a lot of people was not easy I don't think I'm managing people, managing myself, managing school. There's just a lot of things that like life doesn't stop and you think that it, like, it's going to and for about a week it did <laughs> and everyone was at our beck and call and life stopped but then it just kept going. And so while I have to manage everything that's happened to me, I also have to manage the things that are going to keep happening to me. And so... <laughs> Managing this is the only way I can really describe it is that I'm managing. Yeah. And what about you, Mama? <laughs> <laughs> I can understand what you're saying about managing. I think, um, you know, we're taking things still one day at a time, sometimes one hour at a time. Um, but we're, we're in it together, which is helpful. Um, and we just keep trying to move forward the best we can. I think we've always been very close. Because, I mean, there were only three of us. And so, like, instead of being a kid, I was an equal. And so I was raised as, basically, as an adult. And, like, I, I was just one of three. And so I don't think, even though there's only two, nothing's really changed. And now it's just kind of us against everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> against the world. Against the world. <laughs> She's um, a very hard worker and sets very high expectations for herself. Almost and that, to a fault. <laughs> almost to a fault. And that comes from her dad. Um, she's also very kind um, and compassionate um, and puts others first. And that's also definitely um, her dad. So I think you got some of his best qualities. <laughs> Honored. <laughs> so tell me, tell me about your dad. I, the, the more I hear, the more I wish I, I would have known him because uh, he sounds like an amazing person. I mean, I was never into the whole like superhero thing, but he was a superhero. Like, I don't know how to put it any other way than that. Like, if I had something going on, he was there. Like, I was in the school musical, and I was a laughable role. I was a cow, okay? And he had 15, 16-hour shifts at the hospital, and he made it to every single one of those shows. Like, if something important was happening, he was there, and he made sure that we knew that he cared about us. And so, like, I try to be like that, but now, more than ever, I'm realizing that 
it wasn't easy. Like it took effort and he put effort in. And I think we all wish that we could do that. But to him, it looked, it looked like he was doing it so effortlessly, but he never strayed away from trying. <laughs> he's the funniest person I know. I mean, wow. I think he's where I got a lot of my humor. At least I think. I think I'm more <laughs> like him in that way. He was very funny. <laughs> like he, he made a lot of jokes, but they were always like perfect. Like, I don't know. And they were always so fast. Like, it's like he wasn't, there wasn't some master plan. He was just funny. And I feel like people aren't like that. <laughs> and he was, and it was, it was great. What else, what he else? He had a very think? quick wit. Quick wit, for sure. What else do you think? And he, well, he just made everybody feel good when they were around him. And so people always wanted to be around him. Don't you think? I think so, yeah. Yeah. He was a lot of fun. <laughs> a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. So when you have somebody that everyone wants to be around and then they're suddenly gone, mm -hmm. walk me through that. Well, <laughs> you want to go? Yeah, so I think um, what we have found in finding our way is bringing him with us. So all of the memories, of course, that we have, you know, he put us first. And so um, we got to spend the most time with him. So we were lucky to be his chosen ones, right? So um, we had lots and lots of time and lots and lots of memories. Um, and so that's kind of what keeps us going. Um, we do things that we know he would have loved still to do. And that, you know, is everything from going to Colts games to, um, concerts, live concerts and, um, going for walks in the neighborhood, things that we know he loved doing, we're still doing to keep him with us and to live in ways for him. Um, and so that's helpful. And just laughing of yeah. all the funny things that we Cause did Because I, I think I know for a fact that he would not have wanted us to be sad. And he would have wanted us to know that like life goes on and to do what we need to do to be happy. And so I think that I think us just laughing <laughs> and doing things that make us happy is enough to get through it, I think. Yeah, and knowing that, you know, he was the salt of the earth, right? So he, so kind, so compassionate. Um, and so knowing that he would want us to be kind and compassionate to ourselves as we're trying to make our way is also really helpful. Knowing that, um, you know, he would not have judged and he would have given us so much grace and said, just do your best and that's good enough. And so there's some comfort in that, knowing that, um, he was always such a calming presence to us. And so that's, that lives on. And so I think that has really helped us in the day to day. So are you guys going to counseling or are you going to therapy together or individually? Or like, what are you, what are kind of the steps that you're taking oh, to make sure you're taking care we, of yourself? We have a lot of therapy, <laughs> a lot of therapy. Um, and just, I don't know. What do you think? A lot of therapy. <laughs> yep. We're both in therapy. Um, I would say we practice um, pretty radical self-care. So, you know, we took the summer and um, just loved really hard on each other um, and tried to come out the other side. You know, grief is like a torrential downpour and it's scary and it's terrible, and you, but you have to, you have to walk through it. Um, and then when you start to get to the other side, it's like you carry this really heavy bucket of water with you and then you learn how to carry it and you get a little bit stronger every day at carrying it. And so that's kind of what we've tried to do. Um, and it's gotten a little bit easier to manage. Um, so we're happy for that. Yeah, because I've never been the kind of person to really accept help from anybody, and my dad was like that too. Like, I can I can do it on my own, and I was very much an I can do it kind of person. But with the hardest part for me is knowing that it's okay to accept help from people, and like people are here to care about me, and I need to trust people, and I need to love the people around me. But that's not easy to do because I mean, getting comfortable again after something traumatic happens to you is not easy. <laughs> Because, you know, there's always that fear that it might happen again. 
And so you don't want that, you don't want to get comfortable because you're going to feel the same way you did the first time. And so getting comfortable with where I am right now is, is hard to do, I think. Was it hard to process just the immediate change to what life was going to be like for you for all time? Yeah, I think it was. Well, because he used to go on quite a few business trips with Lily. So for the first, like, three weeks, I was like, oh, he's going to come back. <laughs> and then I still think that sometimes. Like, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go home and we're going to watch a Colts game. Oh, wait, no, we're not. <laughs> but... The first three weeks were just completely like, oh, he'll be back. It's no biggie. Like, he's coming home. He, he, that didn't happen. And so it got, I think that actually helped a little bit to kind of settle in at first. And then about a month in, it was like, oh, okay, so this isn't just a phase. It's very much a new way of life. And I've got to figure out how to make this work for the rest of my life. How do you think you can best honor him? Um... What do you think? So in going through some of his papers over the summer, um, we found some writings. And he had articulated what he wanted his legacy to be. And um, it was two things. He wanted to be considered um, a caring person and a good person. And we kind of step back when we saw that because we thought, wow, who actually achieves their legacy when they're 49? You know, I mean, he had already accomplished those things. And so um, I think that's one of the, those are some of the things that anchor us as we look to honor him and um, live the way that he would live um, and that he would be proud of us as well. And, you know, we all know that the world needs more people that are kind and caring. Um, so it's a pretty good legacy to kind of walk that path of. Yeah, because, I mean, you told me he didn't really want kids and he was a do like he was a doctor and the minute that I was born like I was the priority and so like it was clear that he cared but it was also clear that I was the legacy and I'm I'm the only flesh and blood like I'm what's left and so that's a lot of pressure on a person but it's also really like motivating because I'm only 16 like I I have a long time to make my life worth it and make people remember him and tell a story and I think that's kind of what we're doing right now. So I think we're off to a good start so far. <laughs> and you're right, you became his priority when you were born. So in the ER, you know, you work lots of nights, evenings and weekends and um, that didn't work so well for him once Eleanor came along. So he wanted more time at home. So. That's when he went to work at Lilly and still worked in the ER on the week, one week in a month, um, but wanted to have a little more balance. So how, when, when you look at him, was he more like he, he worked at Lilly, like, like, like he was more of like a corporate person, and then, you know, he 12, 12 times a year he was an ER doctor? I mean, how, like if you were... I'm just I'm, ref I'm asking this because I'm reflecting back on those headlines where it was right because they all said local ER doctor like I had never thought of him as a local ER I just thought of him as a person that went to work cared about people helped people and then came home like that was I, I knew he was a doctor I knew all of that I had gone to the hospital with him he had showed me around like I was aware of that but like to see him summarized into local ER doctor was weird because that's not all that he was. Like he was a father and he was a husband and he was a brother and a son and a friend and just a general caring person in our community. And to see him condensed into local ER doctor dead at 49 feels kind of weird. Like that's not all that he was to us. Yeah. And, you know, to, to know... To know Brian is to know sort of where he came from. So um, he's from the south side of Indianapolis, uh, loving family, multi-generational greenhouse business. So he grew up working in the greenhouse at a very young age, and it was very hard work from what we're told. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, hard work, but also work that put food on the table for the family. And so um, there was a lot of pride in um, working hard for your family. And so, you know, fast forward, he puts himself through IU Medical School, becomes an ER physician. Um, that was certainly a, an am ambition that he had, but I don't, I never got the feeling that that was the most important thing to him, um, to have done those things and accomplished those things. It was really just a means to an end, which was being a good husband and father. And so, 
to have the headlines be focused on um, his profession was, um, for, for those of us who know him really well, was um, a little bit of a disconnect because he was so humble um, and didn't really identify with some of his achievements. He really identified with um, kind of the, the, the simple things in life that were, you know, friends and family. And he was, he was happy that he had a skill that could help people. So he, that's why he kept working in the ER, because he, he said, you know, I'm trained to do this. Not everybody can do this. I should do this because I can. And so that's what kept him going back to the ER. But really his identity was, was not tied to his profession. It truly was, how do I show up and make this world a better place by just being kind to people, um, taking care of the people that I know and love, um, showing up for people, enjoying nature, enjoying every day that I'm given. Like that, that's really what drove him. Um, probably, it seems to me, it seemed more than. I think that he just lived to teach people too. Like he's like, oh, I have reached some type of success. Let me show how I did it and help other people reach the same type of success. And so I think that we are both very lucky to have been taught those things <laughs> already. And he was really good at living in the moment, really good at living in the moment, which was a gift to everybody around him. Was he a marathon runner or like he what? He was a marathon runner. Yeah. And so I'm a runner now too. And I was, I was sworn against running and I was like, well, if he did it and he liked it, man, oh, I want to be just like him, so I'm going to run. And then he was like, you can do it. And here I am. I'm a runner now <laughs> and I love it. So he showed me like my favorite thing. <laughs> so I am forever in debt to him for that one. <laughs> but he was a marathon runner. He was, he was a football player, baseball oh yeah, player, football. active guy, and walked every day. Definitely more active than I've ever was. <laughs> <laughs> so on that day, was he walking or was he running or what was... Walking. Wh so walking. what was that? Tell me, tell me about so, that day. Your dad loved the month of May. Yeah, favorite month. Favorite. Everyone who knows you know, Brian race knows. Day and race day, <laughs> lots of history and going to the race with friends. Um, May in the greenhouse business is the best month. Um, it's when everything goes out the door and makes everybody happy and um, when all the cash comes in. <laughs> so <laughs> May is always, you know, has always been a very, very special month to Brian. And so um, he was, you know, it was about a week before the race. Um, he, I know he had gotten a message from his best friend talking about how great the seats were this year for the race. Even though the seats are always the same. They're always the same um, seats. But they just think you're really into it, like really nerdy about it. <laughs> Where the parking spot's going to be. I mean, all very exciting things. <laughs> and so what we know is that he was taking a walk um, on a beautiful day um, after his work day was finished and before he was going to go out to dinner with Eleanor. <laughs> I, had, I had COVID, so I was not going to go to dinner that night. Um, and we know that he was happy because it was a beautiful day in the month of May, and um, that's what he loved. He had his AirPods in, mm -hmm. definitely listening to, what do you think, John Prine? I would, I would assume John Prine. Probably John Prine. <laughs> So, and, and what were you doing then? Mom's got COVID, dad's on a walk. Where, where were you? What so were you? I was getting ready to leave for a New York trip with my school because I was taking a New Yorker magazine class for J term last year. And so we were going to go and meet, meet David Remnick and do all that stuff. And I was really excited for that. And then he told me he'd be home to take me to dinner at uh, one of our favorite places, just like over there. And at 5.45, and I was like, all right, perfect. I'll take this time to sit in my bed and watch Gossip Girl and not be productive and get absolutely nothing done. And then it was six and I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. Like he's very punctual, very on time. If he was not going to be, he would have called or texted. And then I kind of came down to you and I was like, do you know where he is? And you just were like, eh, it's fine. <laughs> and she was booking stuff for an Italy trip. And like, it was just warm outside. You're sitting on the front porch. I was trying not to get too close because I didn't want to get COVID. Um, in the grand scheme of things, it did not matter as much as we thought it did. Um, and then 6.15, you'd say, I was like, I came out again. I was like, this is weird. He's never late. Like, that's weird. And then I forget what kind of happened after that. You, we just started. I called a bunch of making times. Making phone calls and, you know, he liked to walk around Butler. Sometimes he would stop and watch um, the baseball team practice or watch a game. So I thought, well, maybe he's just 
enjoying a nice long walk. And, um, but then we got started to get worried. And so we, our f neighbors helped us sort of um, find him. And my aunt drove by and she was like, have you found him yet? And I was like, we're looking for him? Like, he's really gone. Like, where is he? And that was kind of like the turn. I was like, oh no, this is not good. And then we somehow got in his location and we found him. Like, well, we found where his phone was and my aunt and I drove over to the scene and we were like, oh, we talked to the ambulance and they were like, oh, he's at the hospital or he was on his way to the hospital. And then we came back and got you. And then, well, the rest is pretty self-explanatory. So you went to the scene. I did go to the scene. <laughs> what was there? Um, his phone was in the road. The cars were both, like all the cars that were crashed were there. Um, the police were there. Um, ambulance was there. And I, that was weird. I was like, why shouldn't the ambulance be helping my dad? But it was not. And I think, I don't think there was a fire truck there, but then they had roped it off. There were a bunch of people like around taking pictures and stuff, which was weird. A couple people I knew were taking some pictures and I was like, come on guys, <laughs> like, please, please don't do that. And then my aunt told me not to get out of the car. And so I, I didn't, cause she didn't want me to be traumatized, but I still saw everything I needed to see. Um, and they told us that he was at a hospital and we drove down there and they got, they put us in this quiet room and that's kind of, that's the rest of it, I think. <laughs> yeah. So she went with the aunt. What we're telling what you, so you were on the porch. I was on the porch. Um, once we realized that his, um, where his phone was, we were in denial and we thought, okay, well, we just need to make sure that we can um, make sure to, we have time to spend down, you know, at the, it's going to be a long night, right? We thought, well, let's, maybe he has a broken leg or something like that. Because I guess my first thought, because of just who he was, was that, because when I found the location of his phone, I was like, there, there's probably, and then I saw a picture of the accident that one of my friends was like, do you know what's going on here? And I saw it and I was like, oh, okay, he's probably helping somebody because that's just what he did. Like it would not have surprised me for him to be helping someone and for him to be the one that was hurt was just, that was not something I ever saw coming because to me, he was invincible. <laughs> like he was just, he walked on water. And so for him to be hurt was weird. That didn't occur to me that that could even happen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he had never been sick before he had, he was all, all things healthy and vibrant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you went to the hospital and you think he has a broken leg. So how, how did you come to realize that that was not the case? <laughs> it was very confusing. Um, there was a lot of confusion. Um, Looking back on it now, there were a lot of things that we probably could have put together ahead of time. They told us that he was in a different part of the hospital that we could have figured out, probably. They put us in a quiet room, we could have figured that out. Um, but overall, we just weren't really told a lot. And so that was really not handled the way that I would have wanted it to be, I don't think. So did you get to see him? Mm -mm. You never saw, he, he went for a walk and that was it. Went for a walk and a week later I saw him in the casket. So that was not a great way for it to be handled, I don't think, but. So then, three weeks later, you hear that this lady has hit someone else. How did that hit? Um, not well. That was... was awful. Yeah, it was not good. Well, because you think, like, oh, you really want it to be an accident because I, I am a firm believer in believing the best in people and my dad was too. And so I think that he could have been like, oh, could have explained it away. Fluke, I could have explained it away. But after it happened again, you can't explain that away. And so it, it did not feel good. <laughs> no. 
I can only imagine how it felt for their family too, to see it not stopped after the first time. Because if one isn't enough, then I don't know why you need to have two. <laughs> yeah, it was devastating. And we didn't know how we were gonna pick up ourselves after that for a while. Well, yeah, because after there's two, you don't really like, it's real, it's serious after there's more than one. And it, then there's another round of news stories and another round of people coming up, make sure you're okay. Like it, we almost got settled and then we weren't settled anymore. <laughs> and everything was just stirred up again. And to have another family torn apart. I mean, I feel for all those kids that she had, like, this is not easy. <laughs> and I can only imagine how hard it must have been for them too, how hard it's going to be. So were you saying that in, in the first incident you, you were feeling more grace, like this was awful, this was a tragedy, this, but after the second one then that grace was, was gone? Or yeah, I, I stopped believing the best in her. I was like, well, I mean... Doing it once is awful, but doing it twice is just malicious. And how, what is it going to take to get it into your head that this shouldn't happen again? And it's also like the fear that if it happens twice, it can happen three times. And if we're not doing anything about it, then it is going to happen again. And more people are going to be hurt and more families are going to be torn apart. And I don't wish this on my worst enemy. And I really don't want this to happen to anybody else. And yet there's no charges filed in your case. What do you think about that? I think the investigation is continuing, so I don't think um, it's definitive. Um, I think um, if, if she shouldn't have been driving, then of course we would hope that um, justice would be served for Brian. What is justice in a case like this? That's a good point. Because, I mean, if she were to get any type of punishment at all, it's never going to be enough. Because she loses however many years of her life in jail, and my dad's not going to come back. So tell me how that's fair. <laughs> but I don't think that any punishment's going to be enough. But I also think that a punishment and then an opportunity to start again is a good thing. And I want the best for her, I do. But it's really hard to want that right now until we get a little more closure. Are you angry at her? I try not to be angry at anybody because I think I'm more angry at myself than I'm angry at anybody else because I don't like to be angry at people, so I have turned it into myself. But I don't... I don't want to be angry at her. I, re I don't because everybody makes mistakes. But after it happens twice, it's not really a mistake anymore. So, yes, I am pretty angry. Do you have any regrets? I mean, at 16, I mean, you know, at my age, <laughs> you know, the regret list is like, oh my gosh, I've had so much time. At 16, do you have any regrets? I don't have any regrets for my relationship with him. I think that we made the most of the 15 years that we had. I mean, I learned everything I possibly could. I just let all that knowledge come in and I soak, now I'm just soaking it all in now because I, I didn't have time to soak it all in then because there was just so much of it. Um, so I don't have any regrets with him. But I mean, of course there's regrets for letting him leave that night and letting him, I told him to change his shirt and maybe if, or shorts and maybe if I hadn't have done that, he would be five seconds later and this wouldn't have happened. Like, I just think that there are very small things that are not worth regretting because it's not going to change it and it's not worth worrying about. But I have no regrets for how he and I interacted and how we were together. I don't have any regrets about that. If you could talk to him right now, what would you say to your dad? Um, I don't know. There's so many things I could tell him. I mean, what do you think? things I could say. <laughs> what do you think? Um, I think you and I feel a lot of gratitude to him. Yeah. I think we would probably say thank you. 
Thank you for what? Um, just making me who I am <laughs> and teaching me what he taught me at the time that he taught me and not wasting any time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And his love. We were very lucky. Would you say, Brian? Um, I would say thank you, and I would say um, that my biggest regret is not having the rest of my life with him. Mm -hmm. To have more time together. I knew the night I met him that I was going to marry him. I knew he was the one for me. And um, I was really lucky. Mm -hmm. I think what made Brian Brian is that he could make, he made everything better. So he made everyone around him feel good and feel better. Everybody wanted to be around him. Um, he had this presence that not everybody has. And um, it was his priority to just live every day and tell the people that you love that you love them and show them that you love them. And the, that was his priority. And not very many people, or at least I can't for myself, I should say, you know, I, that's, a, that's an ambitious um, way of life for some folks, but he did, the, did it so naturally. Um, it was really just his, his way of life, of being kind and making other people making sure other people had what they needed um, and making their lives better. And it seems so simple, but it was so profound in, <laughs> in every little thing that he did. What is so much more, Eleanor? Oh, I don't even know. I mean, it's just, it's hard to see it summed down into so few words. I mean, he taught me, like, he taught me how to be a person. Like, I don't know how to explain it. He taught me how to mow the grass. Like, I don't know, it's just, it's, it doesn't seem that big of a deal, but to me, like, he taught me how to function on my own, and in the case that I would ever need to, and I know he didn't think that it was going to be at 15, and I certainly didn't, but he knew a day like this would come, and so he did everything he could to make sure that I was prepared, so I'm very grateful for that. Have you reached out to Kiana's family? Have, what's, what, what, or, or, you know, what's been the thought about, you know, this other family? You, you are connected through this awful tragedy. Yeah. We've texted um, during the holidays. Um, it was kind of, you know, texting to say we're thinking of each other's families. Um, and um, we will meet each other someday. Um, we, I think we both would like that. Um, because we all have experienced something that um, will connect us forever. And um, so I think um, we, can, we can appreciate and feel a little bit what each other is going through, so, yeah. That, so that grandma now is taking care of four children under the age of nine. Yeah. Do you, have, do you feel any kinship to those kids or it's an age, the age difference is so great? I mean, I, the age difference is big, but I, I definitely, I mean, I'm not going to pretend that I get what they're going through because I don't, even though it's very similar things. I don't get it. And some people say, oh, I understand. I'm here for you. Like, I'm not going to say that because I don't get it. And I wish that I did because I would take it away <laughs> because they're too young for that to have to happen to them. But I do kind of feel like we both will have something to talk about someday. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So I understand that you wrote something for, your, um, for one of your classes. I did. Yeah. Tell me about that. Um, well, we had an assignment to write a phase paper about a time where we were in a phase of our lives and how it changed us. And so I started mine out by, well, obviously I, was, I read the assignment, I was like, oh, 
have I got an essay for this one. And I wrote it, and it took me till the end to realize that it's more, it's not a phase. And I wrote the whole thing thinking, I was like, oh, this is, my phase is this, it will end, and I will go back to normal. But at the end, I realized that this is my new normal. And I've got to figure out how to exist in my new normal without giving up too much of the old normal. Like, I don't want to lose myself because I still am the same person, but I'm also very different. And so I have to make sure that I can take some of that old normal and add it to the new normal. And so that's kind of what I wrote about. Yeah. If only it were a phase. If only it were a phase. Yeah. What, is it, what is it about yourself that you most want to make sure that you're feeding, that it will thrive going forward? Um, I think I'm a generally happy person and I, I would like it to stay that way and that no matter what happens to me I stay a happy person I think that's really important have you felt happiness um it's a different type of happiness because it's really hard to be happy when you know that like you shouldn't be or at least I feel like I shouldn't be um but I try but it's not the same and I think it will be someday but it's not right now what do you think I liked the, um, the kind of the three things that you talked about in your paper. Oh, I remember that. that you learned from Dad, going for your one. Oh yeah, I learned. He always used to tell us to count our ones, and I didn't really know what he meant by that. I was like, that's kind of weird that you say that, but now I know that he re he meant like take it one second at a time, one minute at a time, one hour, one day, one week, one month, and eventually the time will start to move faster. And so that's kind of how I've been functioning is that every second or every breath I take is another breath and that's good enough and every second or every minute that I sit in class is another minute that I have lived and I have survived this and that it will it's getting closer to getting better I bet you got an A on that paper oh yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> A plus whether it was a pity A plus or not I did get an A <laughs> I've always been a person with really big ambitions and now I feel like I kind of got to do it, <laughs> make it worth it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and where, where are you, mom, on um, Kelly Anderson? Um, that's not my focus. Um, you know, waking up from this nightmare. Um, I had to figure out how to move forward, how to keep going. And what I did is I recommitted to my purpose, which is being the best mom that I can be to Eleanor. And um, that's really kind of what drives me, what keeps me grounded. Um, and the rest, you know, will fall into place however it does. Um, but just knowing that my priority is here is kind of the way that I've been able to to manage. I think you're doing a wonderful job with her. I think, I think, I think that the, the bloom is, is, is full. <laughs> um, and um, what, what do you want for her? I want her to continue to remember the important and valuable things that her dad taught her because they will get her through um, the hard times and the good times and she's doing a really good job of that so far so I would say keep that up <laughs> you know we we have said before that Brian gave us everything we needed to withstand this um, that he left us whole um, and it's probably hard to understand how we feel that way when there's such a huge hole in our heart um, without him, but uh, he loved us so much and left us feeling like we can, we can manage this. Yeah, the first thing I said was we are really lucky people and I know it seems really twisted <laughs> and a lot of us were like, oh, how unlucky can we be? But I felt really lucky. 
that, I mean, I got six, 15 years with the best dad I possibly could have. And I had the dad that a lot of people wished they had. And so I feel lucky.